Hi, I'm John Atak. This is my very dear friend, Mike Grindel. Uh, hi, John. Nice to talk to you again. So, uh, what next, John? What? You've done the, the rock festival, the rock concert at Funchal. Uh, you, you have somehow survived with your life. I mean, listening to you the last time, it's like, it, it's almost a miracle that you got off the island, frankly. I know. It, well, it sort of was. It, mm. That is, a, that is a, an experience that, uh, you know, I hope I never have again, but is certainly a, a memorable moment in the life of Mike Rinder. That's mm. for sure. Mm. I will never forget that incident or that night. That was, that was a that was a big one. You know, a lot of a lot of things have come and gone over the sixty five years of my life, but that one stays burned in my memory. It was a very very dramatic moment in life. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, um, like not not a whole lot happens in in my world from this point of returning to the Apollo. I mean, obviously we sailed across the Atlantic and we're going to go to the United States, to Charleston, South Carolina, which by the way, I am so sad we didn't go to Charleston, South Carolina because three or four months ago, I went there for the first time. It is one of the most beautiful cities in the United States. Wow. It is, it's incredible. It's an incredible place. Any event, so you know everybody knows the story. Hubbard says, "Well, let's go to the U.S." and fifteen miles offshore before we reach the twelve-mile limit, Foster Tompkins, who was in Charleston waiting at the dock, sends an urgent message, radio message to the Apollo, saying, "The IRS and the FBI are waiting on the dock." And so we did an about face and sailed to Bermuda. And mm. that was the beginning of sort of the, the Caribbean years of the Apollo. And mm. I like carried on, I basically remained what I was, Kerry's communicator, and he was the commanding officer of the Flag Bureau throughout that entire time. And you know, I met my wife who came to be in the Flag Bureau, uh, Kathy, from New York at that time. She arrived and uh, we didn't get married until sometime later when, when we got to Clearwater and the great uh, orgy of 1975. Christmas 1975 happened uh, at the Fort Harrison mm -hmm. after the bosun's party. But um, one thing that did happen in, during that era was that Hubbard suffered a heart attack. And this was okay. something that nobody knew. On, on board the Apollo, nobody knew. I've never heard Hubbard this was just in Curacao, Hubbard had a heart mm -hmm. attack and he was taken to the hospital. And he was off the ship for, you know, four days or something. And it was like, where's the Commodore? Where's the Commodore? He's not here. Oh, he must be off doing a shooting, you know, a special film. You know, he was doing those photo shoots at the time for the old mm -hmm. What is Scientology book and the, and the Scientology handbook. Oh my God, those photographs are like, I've got those old books, John, and I look at them mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they are stunningly amateur. Mm -hmm. Like, the shockingly. covers of Advance magazine, yeah. Oh, they were, they were, they were terrible. And everybody is looking at them like the emperor not only has new clothes, he has really nice photos. I mean, it's like, it's crazy to think now that we could look at that and go, this is, this is, you know, the pinnacle of, he has perfected the art of taking photographs. Mm. And that's kind of how he presented everything that he did. He perfected the art of taking photographs. I don't know if you saw last week in The Guardian, the article with Neil Safadi. No. They interviewed Neil Safadi, who was one of the Apollo stars, and 
Neil lives in Florida, and he's a, he's another terrific guy that I know from back in the day. And there's a link there to some of the Apollo Stars music, and this music was Hubbard's uh, revolutionizing of popular music. And if you listen to it, it's like, holy shit. This sounds like, like some guy got hold of a, you know, a synthesizer machine or one of those pianos that you play a key and it starts going and then you add something else and this is state-of-the-art revolution we're going to change the world of music with the apollo stars in any event i i so i digress as always mm -hmm that he, and I only found out that he had suffered a heart attack at that time after I had left the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. I did not know, and I th it was either Lois Riesdorf or Janice or Terry or one of the messengers at the time told me that that has, is what had happened. And that he, uh, Hubbard was in hospital. It was super hush hush. Nobody were, knew anything. And of course, nobody ever asked a question. You didn't ask, what's going on with the Commodore? Or, what's going on? Or, what? Like, you learn very quickly not to ask questions like that. It's like people go, why isn't anybody kicking up a stink about where's Shelley Miscavige? Well, if you're in Scientology, you don't ask that question. No. I mean, Leah Remini asked that question of Tommy Davis, and the famous response, now gone down in history, of you don't have the rank to even ask. So that incident, I came to find out, was the main impetus thereafter for leaving the... Apollo and moving ashore. Yeah. Because the hospital in Curacao was not, you know, this was not the Mayo Clinic. No. This was uh, a little rudimentary, and I believe Hubbard started to recognize his, his mortality. Mm. And so the demand was we need to get back to the United States. And that started a whole train of events of figuring out A, where to go, and then B, how to get all these foreigners into the United States. Mm. Like, there was a lot of people, I mean, there were many staff of the Apollo who were US citizens, but there were a lot who were not. There were many, many South Africans, Australians, New Zealanders, Brits, Europeans that were on the Apollo and mm. someone had to come up with the solution for how does everybody get a visa all at once. Mm. And that was uh, quite an evolution that was gone through to be able to bring everybody to the United States. And maybe mm. that's, that's, you know, like the next chapter that we will discuss on our next get together, whenever that will be. Um, because I don't know that we want to embark on that whole new subject. The, the issue of Hubbard's mortality is a fascinating one and something that I came to have a lot more understanding about subsequently you know, after leaving and looking back and seeing events like when he had another heart attack at La Quinta and David Mayo was called to La Quinta to audit him. And that was the start of knots. That was mm. how the new era for Ned I, for OTs came about. I interviewed David, David Mayo extensively for hours about that. And what he told me was absolutely in contradiction to everything I had heard about it. And because at the time, David, you know, I interviewed him in 1986 first, and again in 88. But in 86, because he was being sued, and there was this whole thing that he was the guy that developed the material that was New Era Dianetics for operating Thetans, or operating Thetan level five, as it became, new OT5. And 
what he told me didn't actually fit together with that. He said that when, he, and so I didn't go public with it because I didn't, you know, I was employed didn't on his- Didn't want to jeopardize his lawsuit. No, and, and I'd been employed to help with the law, lawsuit and, and right. I, I, you know, my boast is that I managed to get his lawyers $2.9 million in costs by giving them a strategy, which I charged them $1,000 for. I'm a halfwit, <laughs> I really am. Um, what can I say? But David pretty much said that what he did with Hubbard at that time was based on misownership, misownership of ideas and concepts, and that Hubbard, right. when they came to finish up and Hubbard was feeling a bit better, he'd be in the middle of a session and Hubbard would say, stop, write this down. And all but six of the, I think, 58 bulletins were written by Hubbard in that way. Middle of the session, he'd say, write this down. And he'd write something about body thetans. And I remember coming out of the interview with, with my own, I didn't believe any of it anymore by this time. So it didn't make any difference to me. <clears throat> but I sat down with somebody who'd paid, I think, $400,000 for the OT5. And I didn't know that one. And I said to him, oh, David said it wasn't actually about body thetans. And this guy, his face fell. It was sort of, you know, so I was given this spurious material when all that David was saying, and David, of course, ultimately renounced everything. David, the last time I talked to him in 2013, we talked three hours. And he said, don't believe any of it anymore. Don't believe any of it. You know, that. but at that time in 86, he still did. And he believed that, you know, that a huge problem for human beings is that they function on other people's ideas. And that is actually true. But the way of pulling them out by using an auditing process, I don't think is going to work. I think you have to sit down, have conversations with your friends, think about things, read things and go, do I really believe this? You know, or is this right. because my granny told me or I read it in a school book or it was on the radio or it was in an hour on a textbook, you know. Do I believe I've got yep. little gold discs in front of my eyes, which I see through, you know? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, that's fascinating. We should talk about uh, about that because because of that litigation and because I happen to be one of the people that that was involved in litigation who had reached OT3, I was charged with reviewing all of the transcripts of the conversations between David Mayo, Melanie Murray, who was the messenger yeah. on duty at the time, and L. Ron Hubbard about the development of knots. Mm. And I know for a fact that crazy, I mean, you talk about crazy, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, there are thousands and thousands of writings of his about the auditor's role and how the auditor interacts with the pre-clear on the other side of the e-meter and et cetera, et cetera, mm. that applied to everybody except for L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, the because auditor controls he literally, the session. He literally was telling David Mayer, now ask me this. Now ask me mm. that. Now what's the meter yeah. saying? Now now what about this? What now stop? No, don't do that. No, don't ask me that. No, ask me this. And we're like, what? This is not this and okay, so then that gets chalked up to research. Research. This is Hubbard's uh Hubbard's like one word fits all explanation for manufacturing bullshit is research. I, re I have done, I have researched, I have done this research, I've done extensive research, it's extensively researched, it's proven, it's blah, 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 blah. And it's just stuff that he was just like making up or thinking up or, well, it could be this or it could be that. Or, oh, 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 yep, that's good. Yep, yep, yep. Let's write that one down. And it's... Uh, it's a remarkable history, but I, I was going to make the point, John, that this, the thing about the mortality of Hubbard and his inability to fend off or stave off the, the, 
heart attacks, the the pancreatitis, the the terrible physical ailments that he ultimately had had to be kept such a secret. Yes. Because it you know a lot of people say, well, um Hubbard was a flawed person, you know, he abused his wife, he abandoned his children, he did this, he did that, he took drugs, and blah, blah, blah. And I, I know that every Scientologist goes, yeah, but so what? He developed a technology that helps millions of people, it has helped me, that he was flawed and that there was thing that was, you know, he had to overcome all those things with his technology and he did. And he became a great man. Except you cannot you cannot justify and explain the fact that he claims and claimed not just in Dianetics, but a thousand times subsequently, all the way through Ned for OTs and, and solo Ned for OTs, that auditing cures illnesses and prevents diseases, and being not PTS prevents you from getting sick, and being able to isolate the body thetans that are mocking up cancer prevents you from having cancer, etc., etc. So all the way through his life, his life post-1950, any physical condition, ailment, or whatever that he had, or even emotional issues that he had, mm -hmm. had boy, to be Boy, did he have kept... emotional issues. Absolutely. <laughs> but you'll see there's all sorts of explanations for that, mm -hmm. too. It's moving on the tone scale. And, you know, it, anger, anger is required to handle a one, one. Mm. And, you know, like there's a, a million things, but the one thing that you can never actually deal with and explain away is the fact that he didn't have enough control over these things to prevent himself from having a number of heart attacks and ultimately dying a f mess. And that mm. is why the, the great, L. Ron Hubbard passing ceremony uh, with Pat Broker, David Miscavige, and Earl Cooley is a, such an incredible event to look back on. Mm -hmm. the, the absolute bald-faced bullshit of that event is astonishing. And it is what launched the career of David Miscavige. Mm -hmm. That is what made oh, yeah. David Miscavige taking over Scientology possible. Because mm. if those guys had stood up on stage and said, well, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, it's with great sorrow that I have to inform you that our founder has died. He died of a heart, a heart attack. He had pancreatitis. It was a, a thrum. Uh, it was a, he had a stroke in the end. Um, he was not in good health. He was ranting and raving about BTs on, on fence posts and asked Saj Gabodi to produce an e-meter that would blow his BTs away and kill Sir, his body. Sir, Sir, Serge Fouth. Yeah, Saj Fouth. Yeah. What did I say? Saj Gabodi. Oh, so, oh, I'm That's stuck on right. David Mayer. Steve yeah. Fouth. Saj. Yeah. Steve, yeah. Stephen Fouth. Yeah. Um, and he didn't leave any instructions as to what was to happen in Scientology. He didn't write a Ron's journal. He wasn't, uh, he didn't have a, a, a plan for who was going to take over or how Scientology was supposed to be run. None of that. And what would have happened had that truth, which all of those things that I just said are 100% true, what would have happened had that been the story, which is the true story? And not only that, he was living in a motorhome with, you know, long fingernails, long hair, sort of unkempt and hiding from the government under an assumed name, Jack Farnsworth, that that 
would have been effectively the end of Scientology. Because no matter who you were in Scientology, I mean, I, 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 I can't say that 100% of people would walk away because I think it's proven by the Jehovah's Witnesses and QAnon and various other things that, you know, even when the most earth-shattering facts are presented that disprove everything that you have believed up to that point, you know, Armageddon is coming on the 7th of September, 1973, or Armageddon is coming, or, you know, Donald Trump will rise again, or there will be a takeover by the military, or whatever. When those things don't happen, not everybody walks away. But uniquely... Here's, here's the textbook. What is that? It's when, oh, prophecy when Prophecy Fails, Fails. by Leon Festinger, published in 1956, which it, actually the woman he's writing about was a Scientologist, and she said the aliens are going to come and pick us up from the mountaintop. And he predicted that cognitive dissonance would set in. He's the guy that first gives this idea. <clears> Those <throat> people who actually went to the mountain and were not picked up would continue to believe. Right. Because that which we believe is strengthened by evidence to the contrary. And it, it is said to be the most explored uh, theory in psychology. That it's been proven tens of thousands of times. And absolutely, Uspensky is a really good example because at the end, you know, having defected from Gurdjieff, because Gurdjieff was a bit too violent, Uspensky, on his deathbed, summoned his chief followers and said, forget it. Um, nothing I've taught you is of use. Start with something simple. Start with something you know. And it created several camps, some of whom said, oh, well, he was just a bit poorly at the end and it's all good. Some of whom said, I don't believe a word of it. And some of whom said, well, we'll pick through it and see if there is something simple in there that we can start with. That, that continued, Rajneesh, there are still people who follow this man. When you look at these people, and Hubbard is, it's incredible. When, let's add together aspects of his health. He had asthma all his life. And he said in Dianetics it could be cured. He was short-sighted and had to wear spectacles all his life. And he said in Dianetics it could be cured. He had bursitis in his right shoulder where one of the bursas did not lubricate the muscle joint. Had it all his life. He was obese. To, to the end he was probably morbidly obese, but he was massively overweight. He smoked up to 100 cigarettes a day until the last couple of years of his life. Um, Kimma Douglas said that she was pleased that he'd cut down to 80 cigarettes a day, which meant when this one was put out, another one was lit. And yet this is the founder of Narconon, which gets you off drugs. He was a chronic alcoholic. When I talked with Virginia Downsborough, who rec um, rescued him from Gran Canaria, uh, when he'd researched OT3, and Virginia, you know, the guy I was with, this was in 86, and we went and interviewed her at her centre. And um, the guy I was with said, well, oh, really? He was on drugs when he did OT3. She said, shh, there are people in the next room doing it, right? <laughs> and she said, when I got there, he'd stopped eating. He, he was taking a shelf load of drugs. And I said, what were they? And the second time I interviewed her, I said, what were they? David Mayo in 2013 said she would told him what they were. And I said, please tell me what they were. It would be useful. I know they're amphetamines because he frequently recommended Benzedrine and other amphetamines. It's right there in Dianetics. If you have to grab right. hold of something, grab hold of Benzedrine, it really improves auditing being out on speed. Um, he admitted to having been addicted to phenobarbital. There's a lecture where he says, I made myself a guinea pig in one of these experiments. Well, that was in the Veterans Administ Administration Hospital at Oak Knoll and then with VA later it was prescribed for the ulcers that were the excuse he'd used to not be sent to Korea. He'd been trained to go there. He'd later claimed to have been the Provost Marshal commanding everybody in. We got a letter, a signed letter from him saying, I was the Provost Marshal in Korea. Um, so he's a lying swine, what can you say? The ulcers were never found, x-rays didn't find them. He was just a malingerer. The war wound was that, but he was taking barbiturates, phenobarbital, also called Nembutol. He tried to get a prescription for it in East Grinstead in 1965, signed Dr. L. Ron Hubbard. You know, so he's a junkie. 
He's also <laughs> taking Demerol, which is, is an opiate, but a shelf full of drugs. This is research, so it's justifiable. Um, there's a letter where he talks about taking pinks and greys uh, from Grand Canary writing to Mary Sue. So he's doing all of these things. His teeth rot in his head because he's terrified of dentists. Um, he has uh, various doctors, I think Gene Denk in the end, was it Steve Jarvis in the 70s? They would write, they would sign whole prescription pads for him so he could get anything he wanted. And, you know, I talked with people who were with him, in, uh, Richard DeMille and uh, Barbara Cloden, who were with him in the, from the, through the whole process of Science of Survival, the second book, late <coughs> 50 into early 51, over a six-month period. And they both said, well, when he was in L.A. living with Barbara Cloden, having deserted his second wife, he was drinking a bottle of scotch a day, on top of the amphetamines, barbiturates, whatever else. When he went to Cuba with Richard Mill, he was drinking a bottle of rum a day. You know, when in Cuba, do as the Cubans. So he's fat, lazy, extremely rude, got no manners when he eats his food. He's a pig. He's, he's this awful human being. Uh, Cyril Vosper, who wrote The Mindbenders, used to delight in talking with um, body routers, recruiters on the street at, in Tottenham Court Road in London. And he'd be walking down the street and they'd say, oh, wow, well, um, do you want to know about Scientology? You know, what would you like most like to be? What would you most like to do? <clears throat> this stuff. And he'd say, I knew Oren Hubbard. And he said every time he got this, wow, you know, you met Ron. And uh, they'd say, what, what, you know, what was the thing that really struck you about him? And he'd always give the same answer. You say, his breath stank because his teeth were rotting in his head. So we started a conversation talking about the God, you know, and the, the superhuman being. The, one of the things that fascinates me, I can't think of any place where he says he did anything that was magical and wonderful, you know, that where, where he achieved anything. We also, we touched on, you know, David Mayo and his auditing of him. Of course, Otto Rose was his auditor <clears throat> on the ship b before you arrived. Right. And Otto, the only person to do OT8 before 1988, and probably a quite different version, but Hubbard put him through it. Hubbard's personal auditor, Hubbard's personal case supervisor, and he was put, a, Hubbard was sick. Every year Hubbard would get sick. The, the, in 1965, we get the clearing course out of him having bronchial pneumonia. In 1966, we get OT3 out of him having bronchial pneumonia. Okay, heavy smoker in the winter. It's not, you know, and he's curing this year in, year out, by, and right. then he gets it again. So he's very sick yet again because he is a potential trouble source to all of humanity, basically, because he is a suppressive person. And Otto gets every scrap he can. He said he, everything that was written about Hubbard's auditing, he said he had little scraps of envelopes. He had, he reckoned he'd got stuff going back to 1949, I think everything that was written so he did a total folder error summary on all of Hubbard's stuff. Now Hubbard had put forward this idea that if you've got a rock slam, the needles slapping all over the place on the e-meter, well that was because of your evil purposes and of course later in the Florida flag land base people would, a massive amount of the crew were put onto the Rehabilitation Project Force because of a single rock slam. Now, you and right. I know that the E-meter can generate these things on its own because we've seen them doing it with no cans <clears throat> plugged in. And it's carbon coming off the potentiometer and the tone, tone arm messing up the works. So, rock slams. What got Otto thrown off the ship was him sitting down with Hubbard and saying, I found 200 rock slams in your folders. Sir, you have evil purposes. They gave him his passport. He was pretty sure with, I think, $5 in his pocket. So here's this man who is chronically... Yeah, that takes some balls. Yeah, yeah. Well, Otto does, you know, one thing you can say about him, he has cojones, you know. Um, and he went off and made a multi-million dollar corporation secretly auditing all of his people without telling them that he was doing Scientology. He was delighted when the ability meter um, 
Barry Pemberthy made this thing and he said, he was mending e meters, he said, why are all the components for the e meters so cheap? They're rubbish. You know, I later talked with a guy who'd uh, costed the Mark VI and he said Texas Instruments said they'd build it for $38 and we're selling it for 2000 So Barry made a meter using all the best components, just the jewel on which the needle pivoted cost more than all of the components from Mark V e meter. And Otto was so pleased because now it didn't say Hubbard electrometer on the dial. Right. It said ability meter. So he didn't have to tape over that bit anymore and he could take his stuff <laughs> through this stuff. Oh, no. But it's... Uh, oh, what boy. are the titles for... Okay. Like, what are the titles for Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky? And if you look in the back of Russell Miller's Barefaced Messiah, it says in the bibliography... Hubbard Through the Looking Glass by John Atack, which is the book that, you know, I don't resent it at all. I worked with Russell on the book. Um, he used my book as the basis for his book. My book came first. But it was called, uh, and about half the research in his book is original to him. He did phenomenal research. So, and it's a great book. Everybody should read it. Um, but I called it Hubbard Through the Looking Glass because everything is the opposite of what it seems that Ron Hubbard was a sick man mm -hmm. who was ill all the time. He was a heavy drinker. He was a heavy smoker. He was a beast. He had terror stomach, as he called it in the 50s. And he, he went out. It's like the stories about Rajneesh, that you find that Rajneesh, his followers all believed he'd took, taken a, a vow of silence because he would come out and look at them and go, me nasty, me nasty, sorry, namasty, namasty. And he wouldn't speak. And then he'd go and tell Maranand Sheila what to do to screw people's lives up. And his bodyguard, Hugh Milne, said, well, he was taking a hit of 50 milligrams of Valium a day. And the normal dose is two to five. And had two one-hour sessions a day with nitrous oxide, which, of course, is the drug that gave Hubbard the revelation that began everything in February 38 right. with Excalibur. But in public... There's one person who is the great, enlightened, um, you know, Rajneesh was not modest. He called himself Bhagwan, or the Supreme One, the Great right. God. You know, Hubbard only got to source, you know, as far as he got. <laughs> but you're actually looking at a man who is crippled. He's crippled in his relationships. He can't stand his own children. Mary Sue Hubbard at various times says, you're a charlatan, one of the jobs that... Otto got on the ship was because, and he heard her screaming at Hubbard, you're a charlatan, you're an absolute charlatan. And so Hubbard said, what would I have to do to prove to you that, that Scientology works? She said, I've never been exterior with perception. And so he said, OK, Otto, find every <laughs> process that makes somebody go exterior, run them all on her. And Otto found 90 processes. And after a few weeks, Mary Sue Hubbard said, I can't take any more of this. <laughs> and that's Scientology. And it's people like my 50 is, hours of opera by dupe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know. Um, oh, dear. But, and as Karen LeCarrier said when I talked with her the other week, she'll say to people, it doesn't work, the claims aren't true, there are no OTs, there are no clears, there are no communication releases. Scientologists most certainly can't communicate freely with anyone on any subject because they can't <laughs> yeah. talk to SPs, they can't use verbal tech and they talk, can't talk about their cases. So it's kind of limited to, <laughs> to nice day today, isn't it? You know? So none of it happened and people will say, didn't you have wins? And it's like, right. I have wins just by talking to my friend Mike. I don't need to, any Scientology to do that. I understand the world by living in it. And, right. you know, most of Scientology is, is a fairy tale devised by a, a very sick man who was trying to heal himself and failed <laughs> utterly and dragged us all into that. And, you know, what we've learned from that, we can now possibly help the world with in terms of preventing these kind of authoritarian relationships this kind of you know the bully and the person who's willing to be bullied you know and yep. say we don't want either of those types of people in our society gosh <laughs> i wax lyrical <laughs> there you go well 
as always, John, there's a lot of a lot of wisdom in in your perspective on things, Thank and you. you're you're so well informed and so well read, and you've spoken to so many people. I I always find it entertaining to hear the anecdotal stories about things that happen that mm -hmm. I have seen p bits of in my life or experienced pieces of, but then you hear the behind the scenes or this is what the, this is what this person said about what was happening then or this, and that stuff is fascinating to me. And I, I know that for a lot of people, I perform that function. Exactly. Like, for me, I, you I, do. I, I, I do that for some people, but for, for me, you're the guy that does that for me. Like okay. you give me insight and always have things that you like people that you've talked to or experiences you've had or research that you've mm -hmm. done or books you've read that I go, Hmm, that's interesting. Didn't know that before. Wow. Great. So but that, that's my I, experience I, as, of life. as always, as always, that's just my experience yeah, of life with I know. nobody I've met in my life. There's nobody I've met who hasn't told me something that I didn't know. I mean, today you've told me about the heart attack in Curacao. What an important piece of information that, that you know, he saw that. You've also, you've given insight. Um, you know, so we share this thing. It, it's, it's the place where we are. We, we are um, survivors of Scientology. <laughs> and thrivers. <laughs> exactly. And thrivers. Exactly. Yeah. survivors well, and thrivers i'll go with that yeah so let, let's probably bring this to a close though i could really frankly sit and talk with you all day long mike and we'll probably I know. cut this in cut this into a couple of episodes and we'll come back in a few weeks time and um we'll talk about how the visas were got and and, right. and that long and the Fort Harrison and the Jack Tar and all of that kind of stuff. Um, okay, terrific. As ever, it's been a tremendous pleasure. In fact, whenever we talk, it's even more of a pleasure every time. You know, what can I say? <laughs> well, I feel the same way, John. So I look forward to talking again. And thank you, as always, for your work and your insight and your willingness to just be there and keep persisting mm. yeah well and and likewise that and thank you for the enormous courage you've you've shown in in doing what you've done because you and i both know what it is to stand up against david miscavige and scientology we have both had that experience and those who have not have no <laughs> idea <laughs> there you go okay Great talking with you. I'm John Atak, my good friend Mike Rinder, and uh, thank you all for spending some time with us. We will see you again, hopefully. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.